Well, welcome everybody to this evening's lecture. Vet Education is proud to present a free webinar on nutritional support of the patient with canine parvovirus enteritis. This webinar has been brought to you by an upcoming course that we're running at Vet Education. It's called Infectious Diseases in Small Animal Practice. We're going to be talking a lot more about parvovirus enteritis during the course, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the course later on, but it is a four-week interactive and tutor-guided course. It starts, as you can see on the screen there, on the 8th of June, Monday the 8th of June. It runs for four weeks. It's been race-approved for 20 CPD points. So if uh, most places in the world recognize race CPD credits, so you can uh, certainly uh, join that course and uh, learn a lot about infectious diseases. We're going to cover specifically respiratory, gastrointestinal, neurological, feline infections and urinary infections. And there's a couple of extra surprises I have in there for you as well that I'm going to tell you about through the lecture. Let's get right into canine parvovirus enteritis because when we're thinking about nutritional support, I'm going to be talking specifically about the gastrointestinal tract and how we can feed this gastrointestinal tract. We have a number of problems. And I'm going to ask you guys a question. Of all of you who have treated cases of canine parvovirus enteritis, getting nutrition into these patients can be a real challenge. Just give me a yes or no if you agree with that statement there. Yes, if it can be a real challenge to get nutritional support into these patients. Absolutely. This is a real problem, real world problem, because our patients have a bunch of things that go on in their gastrointestinal tract that make them really not that keen on eating food. So we have to find some way of getting it into them. And once the food gets into their gastrointestinal tract, it frequently comes out in a form that's uh, either we don't particularly like, uh, like diarrhea or vomit, um, or it comes back before it's had chance to do that patient some good. So let's just run through some of the problems that these patients can have. The first is anorexia. I've just alluded to that. These patients are sick and they're oftentimes mentally quite dull or obtunded. Uh, we may have even given them medications to assist them with pain relief, which can also further obtund our patients, makes, making them clinically quite dull, and that can further suppress their appetite as well. There are a number of things going on with these patients. They can have secondary bacterial infections. They can have systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and some of them even go into sepsis or septic shock if they become overwhelmed with the degree and scale of the infection that is present. So anorexia is a big problem, and it means that voluntary intake of food is something we need to overcome. We as veterinary nurses, technicians, and veterinarians working together as a team need to find a way to feed these patients. And I see that uh, uh, I see that uh, there are some of you who are, are just saying that yes, maybe there's a um, maybe there is a uh, an option to fast these patients. And in the very early stages of parvovirus enteritis, a short period of fasting can be beneficial. But answer me this question here. How many of you see parvovirus patients when they have just presented being sick, maybe for one or two hours? Most of us see these patients when they have been sick or unwell, or at least anorexic, for quite a, la a large number of hours, maybe even one or two days, depending on the, uh, how observant the owner is and how quickly they are getting these patients into us. But many of these patients have already been fasted themselves for many hours before they get into our clinic. So one of the key things we need to do is to start thinking about feeding these patients very, very quickly or very early on in their period of hospitalization. Another major problem that we have is vomiting in these patients. We can feed these patients and they will vomit oftentimes very quickly or very soon after we feed them. These patients, they'll oftentimes vomit. 
without us having fed them at all and they may vomit several times a day um, you know upwards of 10 20 or 30 times a day it's frequent that we will get these patients out of their cage palpate their abdomens or even just do a simple physical examination and have them regurgitate or vomit onto the uh, onto the isolation room floor without us even having fed them anything and I'm going to show you a couple of images about why that is the case and a couple of strategies we can use to help reduce the frequency of them uh, of, of them vomiting Hand in hand with vomiting, if you can consider that you are vomiting maybe 10 or 20 times a day and you're vomiting gastric acid in amongst a primordial soup of gastric secretions, these are going to flow past the esophageal mucosa and esophagitis is a real issue in a lot of patients with parvovirus. I want you to type in the chat box if you have ever seen a patient that have that has uh, had parvovirus enteritis that when it vomits it extends its neck maybe even vocalizes and tries to swallow several times afterwards but seems in a lot of discomfort much more discomfort than just a regular vomit will cause a lot of dogs when they vomit they'll vomit and as soon as the vomits come up they'll feel much better and many of these patients will be vomiting and then they'll stand there with their neck extended and they'll feel really really uncomfortable and that's because their esophagus is being damaged by the repeated insult of gastric acid uh, against the against the esophageal mucosa and the esophageal mucosa is relatively thin uh, it's not designed to withstand prolonged exposure to gastric acid so uh, erosion certainly are a, a significant issue with a lot of these parvo patients thank you so much for typing in your chat there as well uh, that most of you it looks like have seen this sort of uh, this sort of issue the next clinical problem that we have is diarrhea and together with vomiting uh, this can lead to our patients having quite significant fluid uh, acid base electrolyte and protein disturbances and what I mean by that is that oftentimes these patients get dehydrated very very quickly and they can in fact become so dehydrated that they become hypovolemic as well it's not that uncommon for us to see after explosive diarrhea and and profuse vomiting a patient that begins to show signs of cardiovascular shock and one of the the bad things that happens when we have a patient's in cardiovascular shock is that blood supply to the gastrointestinal tract is reduced when you're in shock. We get stimulation of the sympathetic and adrenal glands, a sympathetic nervous system and adrenal glands, and they will cause vasoconstriction in the gastrointestinal tract, the pancreas and the liver, and also the kidneys as well. But what this does is it further decreases blood supply to the intestine that's in dire need of good blood supply so that it can function and heal properly. The other thing that also happens when we get sympathetic nervous system stimulation is that we get gastroparesis, that is paralysis or decreased motility in our stomach and we also get decreased motility within our gastrointestinal within our intestines as well so that whatever liquid is sitting in our stomach just stays there it doesn't get moved on into the small intestine and whatever fluid is in the small intestine doesn't get moved on to the next segment of bowel the large bowel and so on and so we end up with an opportunity for a massive proliferation of bacteria we get a bacteria produce toxins so we end up with this toxic uh, toxin rich mix of uh, of a bacterial soup if you like sitting inside our stomach and our intestines and this can cause significant issues so that's really the first thing decreased blood supply and decreased nerve supply to our gastrointestinal tract I mentioned blood gas and electrolyte abnormalities if you have to vomit a lot you will lose lots of chloride okay if you have lots of diarrhea you will lose lots of sodium and potassium and also chloride as well so we can have patients with quite profound electrolyte disturbances and why is this a problem for our patients well things like sodium and chloride and potassium are necessary in appropriate concentrations for the normal function of cells in our body not only in our gastrointestinal tract but other places as well like our muscles for example and that can in itself if we have gross disturbances of uh, 
fluoride and sodium and potassium can lead to our patients becoming more and more weak and obtunded. Hypokalemic patients are very weak and lethargic. Um, hyponatremic patients can have severe mental obtundedness. They may even start to show signs of seizuring or even uh, central nervous system swelling as well. And, and so this, that's, a, that's the next thing I really wanted to, to mention about that is electrolyte and, uh, and acid-base disturbances. The other thing I will say is that hypokalemia in particular will decrease motility in the gastrointestinal tract. So when you have these patients on intravenous fluids to help support their hydration and so on, as an aside from nutrition, uh, we need to monitor electrolyte concentrations in our patients so that we ensure that they are sitting within the normal range. Now most potassium, as you'd be aware, lives inside cells and rather than outside cells. And uh, so it's very important that we not only treat hypokalemia when it's present, but even if our potassium concentration is within the normal range on a blood test, we need to be supplementing our patients' intravenous fluids with at least 20 to 30 milliequivalents per litre of potassium fluoride. And the reason for that is that our kidneys have got an obligate loss of 20 to 30 milliequivalents per litre of potassium uh, in the urine uh, for every liter of so oh, sorry I'll rephrase that for every liter of urine that a patient produces there will be about 20 to 30 milliequivalents of potassium in there and the kidneys can't save any more potassium than that that's just in what we call an obligate loss and that means that when we're giving fluids to our patient we need to make sure there's at least 20 milliequivalents per liter of potassium chloride within that fluid uh, I just see a comment there from Meng I, and he adds uh, 20 milliequivalents of potassium into every liter of bags without uh, without thinking um, to, to every single one of them. And that's absolutely right. If you've got a patient on maintenance fluids, so they're, they're not being treated for shock or anything, then that's really the minimum that that patient needs. Um, make sure that if you are supplementing uh, your patient's bags of fluids with potassium that you write, do not use as a bolus fluid because if you give a patient a bolus of uh, of intravenous fluids that's been supplemented with potassium chloride you could kill the patient because they will get a bolus of potassium and the nice thing about lactated ringer solution is that it only has four or five milliequivalents per liter of potassium in it which is quite safe to give to a patient at very rapid rates at which we might treat them for shock so really our supplemented fluids needs to uh, needs to have a, a label on them that tells us how much these bags have been supplemented with potassium and another big notice to say that uh, that we should not use these fluids for treatment of shock or do not use these fluids as a bolus. And I see a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, comments there and make sure we mix these uh, bags very, very well. Once the potassium chloride goes into the bag, we have to mix it. I'm paranoid about this. I'll mix those bags for about a minute or so before they, uh, they get twirled in the air and rubbed from side to side and tipped up and down and all sorts uh, just so that I don't end up with potassium sitting at the bottom of the bag as a bolus and uh, and um, don't use these bags for IV fluid flush as well so really great tips coming through thank you so much guys that's awesome all right what other problems do we have the problems in the gut remember I mentioned gut stasis and you can actually see this with an ultrasound and many of you will have uh, ultrasounded abdomens of uh, not necessarily parvovirus puppies but you may well have you may have seen other dogs with gastroenteritis or gastritis and you may have seen on the ultrasound an image a little bit like this we're actually looking at the stomach here here's the gastric wall here it doesn't look like a nice stomach oftentimes a nice stomach is like a little uh, little round contracted thing with a nice big thick uh, thick gastric wall and it's oftentimes a little bit convoluted and folded in on itself with the uh, gastric rugae that are present. In patients with parvovirus enteritis, I want you to think of that stomach as a stomach that's not moving very much. It's like a big sack. And what happens is it'll fill up with fluid. This fluid is going nowhere. Gastroparesis is what we call this. It's paralysis of the gastric muscles. 
or paresis of the gastric muscles. And we've already discussed a couple of reasons why this might be the case. It could be electrolyte disturbances, uh, could be partly medications that we're giving our patient uh, and uh, the decrease in motility in our gastrointestinal tract that occurs with sympathetic nervous system stimulation and also um, adrenal gland stimulation when these patients are in hypovolemia or they're painful and, and, and otherwise in shock. So what happens here is this stomach will continue to fill up with fluid and the normal rate of gastric fluid accumulation is quite significant. In a 10 kilo dog they can secrete well over a litre of fluid into their uh, stomach every day just as part of normal everyday life. In some patients uh, some estimates are that it is upwards of 2 litres for a 10 kilo dog within a 24 hour period. So we can imagine that this uh, fluid is accumulating at the rate of perhaps maybe 50 or 100 mils an hour in our patients, it's little surprise that if this fluid doesn't get moved from the stomach into the small intestine, that over an hour or so or a couple of hours that our stomach is going to become quite distended with fluid. Add to this that we may in fact have a hypersecretory role when uh, the stomach gets distended and we might end up with a far greater volume of secretions there as well. So what we end up with in these patients, even though we're not giving them any fluid in the initial period of time through their, uh, so through their mouth and into their stomach, they will have a stomach full of fluid and that's why even if they're just sitting in a cage doing nothing, when they stand up, they'll have this massive volume of fluid that's ready to be vomited out. So gastric stasis is a big thing. The next thing is that because this fluid in the stomach is acidic, uh, and it's also full of bacteria, uh, we can end up with gastrocyte injury and gastric wall injury as well. This is a photograph of an endoscopy view just looking up at the uh, at the esophageal sphincter and the cardia of the stomach here. And we can see little petechial hemorrhages. These are not terribly bad. You or I, if we had a forceful um, vomit, we'd probably have little tiny uh, petechial hemorrhages like this just in the act of forcefully vomiting. Uh, but imagine that you are a parvovirus puppy and you are vomiting several times a day. Um, these injuries can become quite significant. It is also possible to have a, an extremely hyperemic and uh, and uh, gastric wall and with far greater degree of hemorrhage than we can see in this image here just because the stomach is full of fluid that is acidic and full of bacterial toxins and things as well that will also contribute to cellular injury. So we have gastrocyte injury. So when we're treating these patients, we need to think about ways in which we can going back to the previous slide, improve motility, but also when we're talking about this problem here on this slide, gastrocyte injury, we might need to look at some uh, acid suppressing medications that help to decrease the amount of gastric acid that's secreted. We've already spoken about intestinal stasis. Now this here is basically what it looks like on a radiograph. We have this condition here called ileus. Uh, it's basically a, a word that's used to describe uh, decreased motility within the gastrointestinal tract or decreased movement of fluid and solids through the intestinal tract. And what happens, you'll see this if in a gastrointestinal or rather an intestinal foreign body that doesn't permit the movement of uh, fluid through the small intestine into the large intestine. What we end up with is stasis of intestinal contents and that leads to bacterial proliferation so the bacteria that normally live in the gastrointestinal tract will proliferate uh, oftentimes not in the same sort of population numbers that you would get in a normal healthy gut so uh, bacteria that can ferment uh, intestinal contents will tend to proliferate and so their numbers will increase and we get a lot of gas production in our intestines and we also get the production of a large number of soluble sugars and small molecules like amino acids from protein that has been degraded in the gastrointestinal tract as well and this will draw more fluid from our interstitial spaces in our intestinal wall into the intestinal lumen. So we get lots of gas and lots of fluid building up within the intestinal lumen.
And this can cause abdominal pain. It can accelerate electrolyte loss from our patients as well, as we've already mentioned before. So another thing we need to be thinking of is what can we do to help improve gastro gastrointestinal motility, both in the stomach as well as the intestine too. I'm going to talk about the medications. I, I, I've seen some really good questions coming through. I'm going to talk about these things when we when we talk about the solutions to these problems. Um, so uh, if I haven't answered your question, uh, hold fire because the answers are going to come fairly soon. The other thing we've also alluded to on that previous slide is bacterial overgrowth. The bacterial numbers, even though parvovirus is a viral infection, uh, one of the side effects of this viral infection is that as we get this gastrointestinal stasis is a bacteria that normally move from one part of the bowel to another um, and are usually not left on their own to proliferate to large pathological numbers, uh, they will begin to proliferate. And so we get massive bacterial overgrowth. And this poses a problem for our patients, particularly in parvovirus, where we can end up with a quite significant uh, damage to the intestinal villi and that can in itself decrease the uh, barrier to these bacteria entering the bloodstream and so bacteremia is actually fairly common in patients with parvovirus enteritis. The other problem with parvovirus enteritis is that it's often associated with immune suppression so a decrease in total white blood cell count and please um, Please type in the chat box there if you have taken a blood test from a parvovirus patient and seen that the white blood cell count is extremely low, well below the normal range. And myelosuppression is actually a, a sign of early parvovirus, uh, parvovirus enteritis infection. It oftentimes doesn't last terribly long, but in that early stage, it certainly can pose a massive risk for our patients. They have low white blood cell count massive intestinal damage and bacterial overgrowth a lot of these patients can develop bacteremia and sepsis and septic shock as well so when we talk about solutions we're going to need to consider perhaps antibiotic therapy in these patients as well this is a stylized picture of villi this is not actually what they look like but a villus atrophy and the parvovirus virus actually multiplies in the cells right at the bottom of these intestinal villi and the intestinal villi grow there's a growth uh, there's a growth zone here in intestinal villi and it's right down the bottom of the villus itself and because parvovirus likes rapidly dividing cells it will tend to infect these cells to a higher degree because they're growing rapidly the parvovirus then destroys these cells and so the villus cells never actually end up migrating up to the top of this nice mature villus we end up with a really stunted looking villus that doesn't absorb food terribly well we've already talked about the stunted villus also perhaps allowing more bacteria and toxins into systemic circulation but it also is going to decrease the surface area of our gastrointestinal tract and to the point where we can end up with uh, even when we start to feed our patients they can end up with a, a, a diarrhea resulting from the fact that they there's too much food in the gastrointestinal tract that they can't digest so we need to be really careful about what we feed our patients so that we feed them the right diet so that they don't have uh, so that they have less uh, less diarrhea as a result Yes, these villi do grow back in time, uh, and there's a great question there. Do they grow back do, back in time? Yes, they do. Um, usually, once you get uh, control of the uh, patient, you know the virus itself runs its natural course over sort of seven to fourteen days, depending on uh, on the severity of the of the illness in the patient. Most of these villi, some of them may well be irreparably damaged, but most of them will. Uh, most of these uh, cells will regenerate, with these villi will regenerate in time. So that just, I guess, highlights the problems that we're dealing with. And I'm going to talk about solutions in a second, but I just wanted to take a brief moment of your time just to talk about the course. I've already introduced the course that starts on June the 8th. Uh, so that's just in over a week and a half. So there's still plenty of time to 
register uh, and as I say it's four weeks long uh, there are tutorials much like this one uh, where we'll go through each week of the course we run through uh, run through infections as I say of the gastrointestinal tract respiratory tract urinary tract special feline infections feline leukemia feline immunodeficiency virus and we also have as well neurological infections uh, in our tutorial we may end up having another couple of little uh, kind of zoom or facebook live type sessions to answer any of the questions you might have during the course depends how many questions come in but this course is race approved 20 cpd points uh, you get a printed and bound course book we uh, do this especially for um, all of our courses both vet courses and nurse courses this is the cover of the book that I've had printed on the printers we're expecting those books to arrive in the next couple of days and they'll be posted out to you in the post and um, but we also have and we're very thrilled to announce that we have joined forces with CRC Press now CRC Press publish a lot of books in the human and animal or veterinary field uh, among a whole range of other books as well and uh, they have invited me to choose a couple of, uh, um, well, not more than a couple, there's about 200 pages worth of chapters from uh, their outstanding collection of books in infectious diseases in dogs and cats, and to write an introduction for this book. It's a free ebook that only members of, or only participants in the uh, in the infectious diseases and small animal practice course we'll get so if you sign up for the course not only do you get your course notes but you get this outstanding book uh, that has got chapters that I went through and um, found areas in the course notes that we are not going to specifically cover because the course is only four weeks and we don't have time to run through everything and I have put those in this book by CRC Press and written an introduction for it and they are making that available free of charge uh, free of charge to you and answer to your question uh, Afrisha yes we do ship worldwide the the books uh, the course books we ship uh, worldwide so it doesn't matter where you live in the world we'll make sure we get something to you so yes, so that's a very, very exciting. I'll show you a picture of that right towards the end of the lecture. We are also producing as part of the course a number of standard operating procedures for management of diseases like leptospirosis and parvovirus enteritis and feline respiratory tract diseases and so on. So you can actually have in your practice standard operating procedures that you can adapt to your own practice environment and have those as I don't like the word recipe, but that they can be really useful checklists to make sure that you're not missing out on anything when you are approaching patients with these pretty serious group of diseases. So lots of fun things happening in the infectious diseases course. There are message boards. You can ask as many questions as you like. You can email me as the course tutor uh, whenever you like about anything to do with the course and, and we'll make sure that your questions get answered. So uh, our aim in running these courses is to give you a maximum benefit. All right, shall we find out what we can do to help solve our patients' problems? All we've done is really list problems in our patients. Let's do something about them. In terms of uh, therapeutics, okay, we listed a number of things of vomiting and uh, gastroparesis and so on. So, and I saw there's some really good questions about the use of antiemetics and gastrointestinal protectants. So we're going to talk a little bit about these and maybe antibiotics. And a really important one that I have found very, very, very helpful, uh, uh, an excellent Simply excellent, I have to say, she's just an amazing person. Uh, Dr. Ava Firth, who's an emergency and critical care specialist, taught me this many, many years ago to place a nasogastric tube in parvovirus puppies that just kept vomiting. You can have these guys on as many antiemetics as you like, and some of them will just keep vomiting. Who's seen that? These patients may be on uh, meropotin, dimetoclopramide, and on dancitron or dolacitron, and regardless of this, these guys just keep vomiting. Place a nasogastric tube, suction out that, that horrible primordial soup that's that's just sitting in the stomach waiting for that animal to move so it can come out. If you suction it out, you'll shrink down that gastric volume and you'll reduce the stimulus for those patients to vomit. And it is like a miracle. It is amazing just what that will do. I'm going to talk about that, how to place these guys and a couple of tips if your patient's too, sh too sick to take to uh, radiography and, and things like that. So um, how often do we suction? I'm also going to talk about, I might as well talk about it now, every one to two hours. These are intensive 
patient. So initially, every one to two hours, we're going to suction these guys. What we want is for them not to vomit, so we can then give them some good stuff, some nutrition, so that they can actually have uh, that they can actually have the benefit of nutrition. I'll talk about nutrition in a little second. I do want to talk about gut protectants right now because a couple of people mentioned things like sucralfate as a gastro as a gastric protectant. Now sucralfate, the name sucralfate stands for sucrose aluminium sulfate. Okay, that's where the name's from, sucralfate. So sucrose aluminium sulfate. And what it does is it dissociates in an acidic environment. Okay, and uh, that dissociation then leaves a free anion to bind to denuded mucosa within the stomach. So it needs an acidic environment in order to become active. One of the things I see a lot of people doing, especially with animals that have got esophagitis, is to mix the sucralfate up in a little slurry and to just give it down there, hoping that the sucralfate will stick to the lining of the esophagus. And that's not how sucralfate works. You need to mix sucralfate in a syringe by all means. Give it orally as a, as a liquid, but then flush it down with, a, with a, a couple of syringes, five mil syringes of of uh, water or saline so that it gets into the stomach because that's when it's able to dissociate and then when that product has dissociated if the animal regurgitates that that um, ionic sucralfate will uh, be regurgitated up with the uh, with the gastric contents into the distal esophagus and there it can stick to the esophageal ulcer okay so that's how we're going to help uh, help our our esophageal lesions. Having said all of that, we don't actually have a whole bunch of proof. If you look in the refereed literature, we don't have a whole deal of proof that sucralfate does all that good a job of managing raw mucosa in the distal esophagus or anywhere in the esophagus. What we do know is that it does, in the stomach, it does increase or stimulate the production of gastric mucus. Uh, and it is also uh, responsible for increasing blood flow to the, gas to the gastric mucosa as well. So we get improved blood supply and an increased amount of mucus being produced in the stomach. And that's, so it's very good at protecting uh, the gastric mucosa, we're a little bit unsure as to how well it protects the esophageal mucosa. Does it do any harm? Probably not. So we usually give it anyway in the hope that it does something for our esophageal, uh, our, so our esophageal mucosa and those patients that do have nasty esophagitis. So hopefully that answers a couple of questions just about gut protectants in terms of sucralfate. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the use of uh, the use of anti-acid drugs in a couple of seconds time. The other sort of solutions we're going to be talking about in the next uh, half an hour or so are microenteral nutrition, feeding hydrolyzed diet, then gut specific diets and recovery diets in these patients. So let's just backtrack a tiny bit and go to sorting out our patient's problems. Remember our patient's problems were uh, largely to do with gastric motility, uh, intestinal motility, bacterial overgrowth, uh, electrolyte and acid-based disturbances and stuff like that. So that's what we're going to kind of walk our way through now. Nasogastric suctioning. We can see that we put a nasogastric tube in this uh, in this poor little, uh, little dog here. Let's talk about this. Placing a nasogastric tube into a patient. Many of you will have seen nasoesophageal tubes placed in critically unwell patients or patients that you want to feed. In an ideal situation, if your patient doesn't have severe gastric disease, if it's just got uh, anorexia for maybe another reason, maybe a dog attack or something like that, placement of a nasoesophageal tube is quite helpful. And where that tube is going to terminate is usually in the distal third of the esophagus. So that tube will be passed to about this level here, just below the heart base. And we could administer liquid diets down here, and these diets are then going to stimulate a distension of the esophagus, the esophagus will then push them into the stomach, and that facilitates, or rather replicates, the normal movement of food from the mouth into the esophagus and subsequently into the stomach. 
And there is some thought uh, amongst uh, a, you know, large numbers of vets, and you may even work with vets, to say, no, I don't want to place a nasogastric tube because if I place a tube through the lower esophageal sphincter, that's going to create a little little gap in the lower esophageal sphincter where gastric fluid can leak out and it can then cause a burning esophagitis way, way, way down here uh, at the lower esophagus or distal esophagus. And that has been used as a rationale for not placing a tube into the stomach. There was a couple of papers that I'm going to show you uh, shortly that took a look at this very uh, thing here, comparison of complication rates in dogs with nasoesophageal versus nasogastric tubes, and they found there was no difference in the uh, in the amount of esophagitis present. So that's the, the, the key thing there. It is a theoretical possibility, but in reality, it doesn't seem to cause uh, a significant issue at all. In fact, there was no difference between these two populations of animals. Relatively small study, as a lot of our veterinary studies are, but certainly the evidence that we have in published literature is that it doesn't, it's, you know, while there's a theory that it might cause a problem, doesn't seem to be borne out in real life. The other argument that's made against nasogastric suctioning is um, that it, if we suck out all of this hydrochloric acid, that our patients will become hypochloremic and that they'll develop a metabolic alkalosis. And this is a really interesting study here that I'll elaborate in a second that found that at least for a period of 36 hours, so sort of, um, just under a couple of days, that, we, that, that there was no significant difference at all in terms of electrolyte and acid-base balance in these patients. So at least for a couple of days, you can be reasonably certain that your patient are not going to show significant blood gas abnormalities just by you suctioning out uh, the suctioning out the fluid that's in there. So let's have a look at a couple of things. How many of you have placed nasogastric tubes yourselves? I see quite a few yeses. There's a good question. Uh, there, what size are we going to use? Very much is dependent on the patient. For really small dogs, you might be using a five French. Uh, for sort of medium-sized dogs, you'd be going up to an eight French at least. And you know, if you've got a mature, large breed dog like a Rottweiler, for example, that's been unvaccinated and maybe comes in at a year old or something, you could maybe even use a ten French. But these are typically pretty small tubes that we're using. I have even needed to place a three and a half French in really tiny little puppies. And really, you are limited to liquids when you're passing when you are uh, when you are feeding these patients by these tubes uh, but they will you will be able to suction out the the gastric contents that are there so this paper here um, just look look typically as uh, if I just go back to the previous slide, most of the time when we're placing these nasogastric tubes, we need to take the animal to radiography to make sure the tube is not in the lungs. And it's not always possible, and some of you may work in institutions where they say, no, a parvo puppy, once it's in isolation, you cannot take it to radiography. Uh, and and uh, But I would recommend that you radiograph these patients after you have placed a nasogastric tube to ensure that it is in the right position, that it is not in the lungs. But there's a couple of things that we can do uh, to help us along the way uh, when we're actually doing this. So basically, in this particular paper, what they did is they just described placement of nasogastric or nasal esophageal tubes designed to reduce complications. And look at the complications here. They're all respiratory, tracheal, oblong, bronchial rupture, pulmonary tears, pneumothorax, and pleural effusion. Why do these things happen? Well, they happen because when we're passing a tube into the nose and we get down into the nasopharynx, we like our patient to swallow, and as they swallow, we pass the tube down in the hope that the tube goes into the esophagus, okay? Because we're doing this blind most of the time. And uh, then we pass our tube down into the esophagus, and many times we'll try to pass this tube all the way down into the stomach we'll find the lower esophageal sphincter there's usually a bit of resistance and so we'll just wait a little bit and then pass that tube into the stomach and then we'll suction and see if we get any fluid out and that's really a sign that we're in the stomach however there's a long length of tube if we haven't been in the esophagus 
and we pass the tube to our predetermined length in which we have determined that uh, the tube should be in our stomach. If we happen to be in the trachea, these tubes can, uh, can go down the trachea, they can go into a bronchus, into a bronchiole, and they can actually puncture the lung. We can end up with pneumothorax, we can end up with pleural effusion if we stick fluid down there, for example. So what they did is they just basically when you're pre-measuring your tube from the uh, external nares down to the level of the stomach, what they do, they just put a little mark on the tube at, from the nares to the thoracic inlet. And what that uh, does is it means basically you're going to thread your tube down to the first mark, okay, from the distal end of the tube to where you would uh, normally, uh, where you'd be entering the chest cavity. And what you do then is you either as you just attach a syringe to the end of your nasogastric tube and if you aspirate air you should then pull that tube out and try again. In most cases there's not a significant amount of air in the esophagus. Okay, Unless you've got a really stressed patient that is aerophagic, most of the time you will get very little air. Um, perhaps with a 10-20 mil syringe you might get 5 or 10 mils of air to begin with, but then you should get what's called negative suction. You shouldn't be able to aspirate any more air. If you get 20, 30, 40 mils of air out of your tube, you're probably in the lungs and you should not push that tube any further into the into the, uh, into the patient uh, because there you do run the risk of causing some lung damage. You should always confirm with radiography, um, but that just minimizes the risk those, to those distal pulmonary structures, the bronchioles and the alveoli. Uh, so I think that's a really, really nice technique. So as you're measuring it, measure from the tip of the tube, like the distal tip of the tube, uh, from the thoracic inlet to the nares, put a mark on it, and then move your tube along the side of the patient to the to where you think the stomach is usually about rib space uh, 11 or 12 and then put your mark on the uh, at the external nares there so two marks on the tube one from the nares to the thoracic inlet aspirate when you get to that first mark if you get air pull the tube out and reposition it really nice technique another thing you can do if you've got a capnograph in your uh, in, in your practice is you can attach a capnograph to your nasogastric tube when you are when you are placing it. This is a prospective study looking at capnography uh, documentation of nasoesophageal and nasogastric feeding tube, and, tube placement in dogs and what they found was they did 24 dogs, they used an 8 French nasogastric tube inserted under fluor fluoroscopic guidance so they had essentially x-ray video to have a look at where the tube was going and then they attached a capnograph at the level of the pharynx, the esophagus and the stomach. And when the tube was in the esophagus and the stomach, the respiratory rate on the capnograph was zero and the amount of carbon dioxide that was reading was zero. If you are in the respiratory tract, you are going to get a respiratory rate and you'll get a positive capnography reading. And if that's the case, at when you're at the level of the thoracic inlet, for example, as they did in the previous study, you can... Uh, you can uh, you can then just pull your tube out and then reposition it in the esophagus. So a couple of really nice ways that we can use to make sure we're placing our tube nice and safely. I've already mentioned this study here where they looked at hyper hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis in dogs uh, and cats. Uh, with and without nasogastric tubes uh, over a period of 36 hours in the ICU and they found that there was no difference at all, no significant differences in pH, base excess, chloride or bicarb concentration between the group. Um, so they, their conclusion was that short-term nasogastric suctioning was not associated with hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. Nasogastric suctioning. Once we've placed our nasogastric tube, there's a few ways we can actually uh, secure them. I'm a big fan of sutures, not a huge fan of using super glue in the nose here. I like generally to have my patients sedated a little bit. I'll oftentimes just use something like butorphanol for example, 0.1 milligram per kilo IV. If your patient's already on methadone or fentanyl or something then that opioid sedation is generally enough. But I really like to suture these and where you see these sutures placed here is the ideal place to suture your nasogastric tube. It is right on on the caudal end of the alar fold. Alar folds this bit here, okay, in the nostril, as close to that as you possibly can. What that does is it reduces the amount of tube that's exposed potentially for the animal to get their 
front claws in there and actually hook the tube out and undo all of your nice work. You can I normally try mine with just a single suture and then I'll secure it with sutures elsewhere as well. And this um, person here on this image here has used a Chinese finger trap to secure there a nasogastric tube there and that's perfectly fine as well uh, the potential advantage with these uh, Chinese finger traps is if uh, something accident accidentally pulls this tube this knot will tighten up this Chinese finger trap will tighten up and uh, the tube in the nostril itself won't tend to move at all and you'll get a little bit more movement with this uh, straight surgeon's knot so how are we going to place these tubes? Uh, basically, we're aiming for ventral medial. Okay, so you have your nasogastric tube, you're going to aim ventral and medial. So I normally aim for the, about the medial canthus on the other eye and drop down, drop that down there. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm going across the midline, aiming for the the the. Uh, aiming for the medial canthus of the opposite eye, but I'm directing my tube ventrally. So I suppose in, in retrospect, I'm aiming for the tonsils on the opposite side of the patient's mouth. And we're just going to want to pass our tube uh, in through the ventral nasal meatus, and oftentimes the ventral nasal uh, passage is quite narrow in a lot of dogs, um, some dogs more than others. When we get to this point here, we're going to um, stimulate, I usually massage the throat a little bit here, and the hyoid apparatus, thyroid apparatus, and hope that my patient swallows, or just put your finger in their mouth and just make them swallow a little bit. As they swallow, you push the tube down, so they swallow this tube into the esophagus. Now when the tube gets to the lower esophagus, sphincter what you will find is there's a little bit of resistance so sometimes you might need to just gently push the tube a little bit back off a little bit just push the tube again oftentimes do that very gently maybe four or five times and what we're doing is essentially just tickling that lower esophageal sphincter or stimulating it a little bit so that it relaxes and then oftentimes then you'll be able to pass this tube through into the stomach we're going to radiograph our patients and this is the sort of image that we're going to see in terms of securing, this is another dog that I, uh, this is a, a dog that I, I sutured here. We've got the suture. I quite like this bit of tape here as well. Uh, this is not stuck to the patient at all, but I like to, uh, if I am going to use anything like super glue, I will su put super glue on the sticky tape and stick the tube to the super glue so that uh, the super glue is not stuck to the patient. If it is stuck to the patient, when you come to remove the tube, A, it's painful, and secondly, you end up with an awful little bald spot there as well. Um, you can get lovely little adapters to uh, to to fit uh, a lot of these uh, nasogastric tubes there and uh, then I usually just attach a uh, an IV extension set and this patient here because it was a bigger patient our <laughs> nasogastric tube finished or basically was only long enough to reach just here so I needed an IV extension set just to take around the side of his head but you can run that tube in between the eyes as well in terms of anti-emetics, uh, we can, we've got a, a choice of probably three that I would like to talk about. The first is meropotent citrate. Meropotent's a great anti-emetic. It's a centrally acting anti-emetic. If these guys are feeling nauseous in their brains, uh, then uh, it is a great anti-emetic to use. One milligram per kilo sub-Q. You can give it really slow IV in dogs uh, at once a day. So it's a fairly easy administration uh, with these patients. Metoclopramide, I quite like as a frontline anti-emetic as well. I'm using it typically as initially as a bolus, so about 0.2 to 0.5 mg per kg, slow IV. Uh, by slow IV, how slow am I going to give it? Over probably two or three minutes. It can cause a transient decrease in blood pressure and a bit of tachycardia in some patients. And in the literature, uh, certainly in pharmacology references, you'll find that some animals that have had metoclopramide given too fast can seizure. So just take it really slow. Slowly, and then I'll put them on a continuous infusion, about 0.4 mg per kg uh, as a loading dose, um, slow IV, then about 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams per kilo per hour. The reason I like metoclopramide, yes, it's a mild antiemetic, but it's got some nice properties. It is a centrally acting antiemetic. It acts at the chemoreceptor trigger zone, but it also has a couple of 
gastric motility functions as well. It increases the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter. So in theory, it reduces or might reduce the likelihood of your patient having uh, gastroesophageal reflux. And it also produces a mild increase in peristaltic motion within the myenteric plexus of the gastric wall. So you can actually get an increase in gastric motility in the right direction. So decreased vomiting, fluid being squeezed out of the stomach into the small intestine. Both of these effects are mild and uh, and that you know that they're not an all or nothing effect uh, because patients can have you know electrolyte and acid based disturbances and so on that can interfere with normal muscle contraction you might not see an appreciable uh, impact of this if you're repeatedly ultrasounding your patients uh, but those actions are certainly there and I think it can work really nicely. Good question. Uh, do we find metoclopramide CRI works better than giving every six to eight hours? The short answer is yes, um, uh, subjectively. And the reason is that metoclopramide, even though the IV dose is listed every six to eight hours, it's actually got a reasonably short half-life and some dogs as short as sort of three or four hours. So they, these animals can go for sometimes quite some time without any uh, anti-emetic effect from metoclopramide. So I generally prefer to have them on a, uh, on a continuous infusion of metoclopramide. Good question, is there any analgesic effects from meropotent? There's certainly some evidence that uh, animals can have experienced some visceral analgesia with meropotent, and that's another plus thing for them as well. And the third antiemetic that we'll sometimes add in if the first two are not uh, not working is on Dancitron. Another antiemetic in the similar class uh, is Dolacitron. With on Dancitron, it's just 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg, slow IV every 12 to 24 hours. You can use higher doses if you need to. Good question. Are we using a combination of these or just one or the other? So my plan is I'm going to put my animal on a metoclopramide CRI. I'm going to give them metoclopramide bolus, put them on a metoclopramide CRI. I'm also going to start them on meropotent because these little parvo puppies, they really need antiemetics. If my patient's still vomiting, then I'll place a nasogastric tube, and I'm probably going to think about a nasogastric tube within the first six hours of hospitalization anyway. And if they're still vomiting, even though I'm suctioning gastric contents, then I'll add an on Dancitron. So sometimes they're on all three. Hopefully that makes sense. They all act in different ways, and that's a really nice thing about them because we're not going to double up on the same receptor. Adjunctive therapy uh, that we can use, butorphanol as an analgesic is not a terribly strong analgesic, but many parvo puppies are not that painful. So sometimes having them on butorphanol as a continuous infusion can be really helpful. Why? Because butorphanol itself is an anti-emetic, uh, uh, an, an anti-emetic agent as well as being an opioid an opioid medication, ranitidine as well as synergistic when it's used in combination with metoclopramide as an anti-emetic. So ranitidine has anti-emetic effects and also mild prokinetic effects as well. It's an anti-acid drug, it's a histamine type 2 receptor antagonist, so it does decrease gastric acidity a little bit. It's not all that good at that job, probably achieves about a 50 to 60% reduction in gastric acid secretion for about sort of four or five hours after you give it IV as a bolus. Um, omeprazole is a much better anti-acid drug. It's a proton pump inhibitor, and we'll often have these guys on omeprazole as well. Uh, but omeprazole, just bear in mind, takes about 24 to 48 hours before it reaches peak gastric acid suppression activity. So I'm always starting my patients on ranitidine at least for the first couple of days, even if I'm starting my patient on uh, on um, on on other anti-acid medications as well. Good question from Kelly. And uh, is a parvo puppy really truly non-painful? Um, they oftentimes seem painful on abdominal palpation. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean that they they weren't painful, but oftentimes we find that they're they're not really all that uncomfortable. Uh, some patients, by all means, if they have that 
intestinal distension and at ileus they seem quite uncomfortable in the abdomen. So for those patients that require stronger pain relief I'd be using fentanyl. Uh, for those that have mild abdominal discomfort butorphanol might be fine. Uh, oftentimes we find once we rehydrate our patients that they become more painful in the abdomen and so if I've already started my patient on butorphanol I might add in ketamine and or lidocaine as well as adjunctive analgesics to that analgesic therapy and if they're still painful I'll just stop the butorphanol and put them on fentanyl so um, so I think that uh, I think that's that's uh, that's the way that I would generally approach them but thank you for asking that question cool what about antibiotics? I mentioned this right at the start. They are recommended in leukopenic patients. So those patients with a decrease in white blood cell count, we would recommend they're on antibiotics. Those patients that have got systemic inflammatory response syndrome, so the symptoms of tachycardia or bradycardia, maybe pyrexia or hypothermia, for example, and either a, a, an, a high or a low white blood cell count, the antibiotics that we're going to use are typically just beta-lactam antibiotics. Uh, most of the literature supports using beta-lactam antibiotics that are effective uh, against beta-lactamase producing. So uh, perhaps second generation cephalosporins might be considered. If you are going to use uh, a drug like amoxicillin, which is not effective against beta-lactamase producers, then you may need to use another drug like metronidazole. Some references also suggest giving patients enrofloxacin as well to help control gram-positive and gram-negative aerobes within the gastrointestinal tract. Just beware of enrofloxacin because of a couple of reasons. And the most uh, important reason to be aware of is that if you have a young animal, a young dog, Enrofloxacin is toxic to chondrocytes, okay, so it will, will cause cartilaginous deformity in joints in growing animals. So I generally steer away from enrofloxacin in these young animals, okay. Now, um, metronidazole is very, very effective against gram-positive and gram-negative anaerobes, and I think that I would supplement metronidazole with a beta-lactam antibiotic that is effective against gram-positive and gram-negative aerobes. Are the other fluoroquinolones uh, safer? Apparently um, a little bit, but not that much. I think they can all contribute to uh, cartilaginous damage there from what I understand, Jonathan. That's a great question. Uh, Andrew has just asked a question, what about sulfur drugs like sulfur trimethoprim? The problem with sulfur drugs is that they are essentially bacteriostatic medications. In order for them to be bactericidal, you need to use higher doses. Okay, so the trimethoprim and sulfur drug uh, inhibit sequential steps in DNA production. And uh, if you're just using a sulfur drug without trimethoprim, it's essentially a bacteriostatic drug. And one of the reasons is that this primordial soup that is existing within the gastrointestinal tract is loaded with folate. And folate is essentially what these sulfur trimethoprim drugs are trying to inhibit the production of to decrease DNA synthesis. So sulfur drugs don't generally work all that well when we have parvo puppies. And the other thing is with bacteriostatic drugs, oftentimes these patients, if we're going to consider using antibiotics, they are immune compromised. And you really need to choose bactericidal drugs when you're, uh, when you're considering your antibiotics. So I generally steer away from sulfur drugs. Most references that I have read with regards to this topic suggest using uh, beta-lactam antibiotics, uh, plus or minus metronidazole. Great questions. So we've talked a little bit about placing, well, quite a bit about placing nasogastric tubes and, and how that might help our patient by sucking out the gastric fluid that's sitting in our stomach. But we can also feed our patient something. It's very important that we stage the sort of nutrition we're giving to our patients. And the first thing we want to do is to give microenteral nutrition. This is basically glucose and electrolytes, maybe with a couple of other things like glycine. Glycine itself is a product that's trophic to gastrocytes, so it helps uh, promote gastrocyte growth. Um, but basically microenteral nutrition, which is glucose and electrolytes, uh, aids in preservation of blood flow to the gastric mucosa. It improves the subsequent tolerance of any diets that we administer afterwards. It increases gastric mucus production and helps improve gastric motility. 
Now I see that we don't have lactate, a couple of questions there. The nice thing about microenteral nutrition is that you can get a bag of lactated ringer solution and you can spike it with some gluco glucose if you've got glycine that you can get in an injectable form. You can add that to that solution as well. And in actual fact, that is my preferred solution. Okay, if I'm particularly, I work with students a little bit and I like to have a sterile solution that I'm giving to my patient. One of the reasons that I'm a little bit wary of these solutions here, and I'm just, I think in the next slide, I've got another picture, so I'll save that comment for later. But basically, if we we can't feed our patient a regular enteral diet that's complex. Um, any patient following injury or illness, severe gastrointestinal disease, or if we're just giving our patient maybe amino acids, for example, or glucose in, intravenously, uh, we need to use this microenteral nutrition. But essentially, we can use vitrate or lactate. These are balanced electrolyte and glucose solutions. You need to discard them after 12 hours. And this is the reason why I'm not that keen on these unless you're really careful with labeling and putting them in appropriate containers. We have grown a heavy growth of candida albicans in a solution of lactate, a little cup of lactate that was made up less than 12 hours earlier and we grew a heavy growth of candida albicans. These things can grow yeasts in them. They can grow fungi in them. They're a great medium for bacterial growth as well. So you need to discard solutions. Don't have make up a big jug and hope that that is going to last you for a couple of days. Make up just what you need. And I, if I'm going to use lactate, and I do uh, in practice, if I, if I use lactate or vitrate, I'll make up what I need. I'll make up a cup full. Even if I'm going to use half a cup, I tip the rest down the sink. I would far rather do that than risk giving my patient something that was loaded with other uh, loaded with other uh, other organisms that I don't necessarily want in my patient. We can also use, as I mentioned, a bag of lactated ringer solution. You can spike it with glucose to make up a 2.5% solution. It's sterile. You can keep it for up to a week after being made up. And you can add potassium chloride, amino acids. Uh, there's amino light solution, which is an intravenous solution that you can put in there. And uh, you can add glycine and glutamine uh, to help improve its effectiveness. And you can use that. You draw it up in your syringe and you disconnect the needle and then squirt that down your nasogastric tube to try and feed your gastrocytes and that's the whole aim of our microenteral nutrition. How much do we give? 0.5 to 2 mils per kilo per hour initially so a tiny amount that's why it's called microenteral nutrition and if the patient you know tolerates that over the first six to eight hours then I can give it a little bit more I just increase it by 0.2 to 0.5 mil per kilo per hour so basically doubling in the volume every six to eight hours and I can use this alongside whatever enteral diet I'm feeding my patient that's a little bit more complex with fats and proteins and carbohydrates and so on. So we can't just feed our patient glucose and electrolytes, even if we add glutamine and glycine uh, and, and, uh, and some amino acids to them. They need something a little bit more complex. Uh, we can continue to give our microenteral nutrition every one, uh, one to two mils per kilo per hour. And I'm going to talk about whether or not we put this on a CRI or whether or not we, we intermittently bolus these patients in a second. But what we need to do beyond this microenteral nutrition is to just calculate our energy requirements, our fluid requirements, make sure we're giving our patient enough protein, supplement any vitamins and nutrients the patient needs, and then begin feeding the appropriate diet. The formula that you can use, uh, I like to use these ones because I don't need a calculator for them, just uh, resting energy requirements is all that you need to give your patient. So for dogs, um, body weight times 30 plus 70. For cats, it's just body weight times 40. If you've got a dog less than 2 kilos, it's body weight times 70. So they're nice, simple formula to use. What I'd recommend is that you put these formula on any hospital sheets that you might have in your practice uh, and against, to, against nutrition plan and that way nobody in the hospital has any excuse for not calculating the patient's energy requirements on admission. Most patients need about 40 to 80 mils per kilo per day and cats uh, need about 24% protein calories for dogs. It's as low as 16% protein calories. So we just need to make sure that whatever food we're giving our patient uh, meets those requirements. 
So then we can look at some sort of food that we can put down our nasogastric tube. And I'm just going to recap a second. When I place a nasogastric tube, we're going to empty out the stomach. We said we were going to do that every one to two hours. Each time I empty the stomach out of the, the, the primordial acid sort of soup that's in there, I'm going to put between half and two mils per kilo of my glucose and electrolyte solution down into the stomach. Okay, and that's going to sit there for the next hour or so. It's going to be absorbed very, very quickly onto my gastric. Uh, gastric mucosa. Then if my patient tolerates that, I'm going to choose a diet that is liquid that's going to be thin enough that it will go down or liquid enough that it will go down my really narrow bore nasogastric tube into the stomach of my patient without blocking my tube up. Okay, and I'm going to select that diet based on its nutrient uh, qualities. Okay, so what I'm going to do when I'm choosing my first diet to feed my parvo puppy, remember that these guys have got damaged villi and they don't tolerate um, masses of really complex nutrients because they haven't got the number of enzymes and the absorptive capacity to absorb these nutrients. So I'm going to feed them a diet preferably that's bland, uh, that's relatively low in fat. Low in fat? Initially, because fat delays gastric emptying, and I want a low-fat diet so my stomach empties nice and quickly. Okay, I've just brushed past that um, major, <laughs> major important fact there. But high-fat diets delay gastric emptying, so which I really don't want. So it's a low-fat, um, easily digestible diet, and of the best ones out there, you want one that's hydrolyzed. So the proteins in the diet have been hydrolyzed. So they're uh, not quite amino acids, but they're small peptide chains, I guess, if you like, rather than big complex proteins. And there are some diets out there on the market. There's not that many for veterinary use. There is a, a great one, uh, Clinicare, I think, make, a, make one. We don't have Clinicare in Australia where I work. But uh, there are some other veterinary uh, manufacturers out there. I think Verbac makes uh, makes a, a diet as well, which is a recovery sort of formula, but it's not hydrolyzed. Um, in the human field, the one that we use most commonly is Vital. Okay, it's a hydrolyzed protein diet, um, and this is very, very easy for your patients to, uh, to to digest and cope with. Okay, if the patient tolerates that diet after a couple of days, or maybe sorry, after about 24 hours, then I'll wean them on to a non-hydrolyzed diet that's bland and low in fat, uh, something like Hills ID, for example, that's blenderized. The proviso here is that I'm going to need to have an esophagostomy tube if I want to give my patient a veterinary diet down there like Hill's ID that's blenderized. Or I can use something that's a little bit more complex like Ensure or Jevity as well. Liquid enteral diets can be quite adequate, but just to give you an idea, Jevity, if we were to break the nutritional content down, has got 16.7% protein, 29% fat, and 54% carbohydrate. So it's too low in protein for cats. It's kind of okay for dogs, just just enough protein for dogs, but it's too high in simple carb carbohydrates. This diet will cause diarrhea in animals if we feed it uh, to them in large quantities. It can also cause hyperinsulinemia in, the, in our patients as well, because there's a massive stimulus for insulin secretion in in our uh, in our critical patients when they have uh, when they're given these diets. The problem with that is that most patients who are sick and stressed have peripheral insulin resistance, so hyperglycemia actually becomes a real problem in these in, in these diets. So what you can do with these diets, just to jig things around a little bit, is add whey protein isolate, which is free of lactose and a multi uh, multivitamin, multimineral sort of supplement as well to bump up the protein content. Uh, fat content is going to stay roughly the same and just to drop the carbohydrate content in any given volume. Um, so that's that's generally speaking the sort of complex diet that we would offer a lot of patients with parvovirus enteritis after they've had the first 24 hours or 36 hours on vital hospital nutrition. Now do we feed them as a bolus? Or do we hook up their nasogastric tube with this liquid diet in a bag and do we just have run it on a, on a fluid pump and run it, trickle it into the stomach all the time? In general uh, terms, bolus feeding is, is preferred if we're feeding by the gastric route. Okay, we can feed uh, with continuous infusion. 
if we've got a jejunostomy feeding tube in, but usually we're not going to be doing surgery to put in a jejunostomy feeding tube in a parvovirus puppies. We want to suction the tube before feeding to assess how much volume of fluid is in the intestines or stomach. And if there's a lot of fluid there and we're going to give it all back again and our patient's feeling nauseous, we might just back off a little bit, maybe feed 50% of the volume we were going to feed our patients as well. These sorts of things you're going to play, uh, take, you know, play by ear in terms of deciding on the eventual quantity of food you're going to give them. But there's no advantage of continuous feeding over bolus feeding, but bolus feeding might normalize intestinal motility because we'll get a short-term small gastric distension, which in theory should stimulate gastric contractions. Okay, we want to give several small meals. The initial capacity of the stomach uh, uh, initial capacity about 5 to 10 mils per kilo of body weight, but the maximum normal capacity of the stomach is you know, up to 45 to 90 mils per kilo. So we're going to just be feeding our patients tiny amounts, no more than 5 mils per kilo to begin with uh, when we're giving our food. You want to always have your patients inclined a little bit with their head facing up. Uh, so whether that's... Um, you, it's going to involve you sitting in the cage with the patient and perhaps having their front legs on, on your legs and their bottom sitting on the floor of the cage just to kind of get gravity on your side a little bit. Um, and small boluses, as I've already mentioned, might stimulate peristalsis. So the question of do, do we hook it up to a fluid pump and so we can administer this food all the time to our patients, trickle it in uh, at, a, at a rate of you know uh, one or two mils per kilo per hour, um, is answered really by the fact that we we probably we may get some better outcomes if we were to bolus feed our patients. How much are we going to feed? Well, this is uh, going to be dictated a little bit by your patient. But our goal is on the first day we want to feed about 25 to 33 percent of our caloric requirement. So we work out our resting energy requirements. Let's say it's a thousand kilocalories in a day. Day one for our little dog, we're going to feed 300 kilocalories in a day, and we're going to split that those feeds into six small meals. Okay, so each meal is going to be 50 kilocalories <coughs> that I'm going to feed my imaginary patient that needs 1,000 kilo, uh, kilocalories per day. So I'm going to feed six small meals of 50, uh, 50 kilocalories, and I'll just give the appropriate volume to deliver those calories. Day two, I'm going to increase that. I'm going to double that. And day three, I'm going to I'm going to increase that by another third again. So by the end of the third day, my patient is being fed its full resting energy requirements. Now, you and I both know that in the real world, that sometimes is not possible. It's going to happen that on uh, day one, your patient will be doing fine for six or eight or ten hours, and then it'll be this huge vomit, and you'll go, oh, great. Well, I'll go back. Just go back a little bit. Backtrack a tiny bit. Maybe feed half of what you were feeding before, and then gradually build up. It might take you five to seven days to get to your full resting energy requirement. It's not an all or nothing thing. Some nutrition is better than no nutrition at all, but we should be trying to uh, trying to get to that uh, full energy requirements in our patients. In terms of complications, some animals just really don't like these feeding tubes, these nasogastric tubes. They'll sneeze and sneeze and sneeze. They'll get up there with their paws. Don't forget to put an Elizabethan collar on your patient after you've placed the feeding tube. Some animals will just not tolerate the diet. They'll have vomiting. We talked about hyperglycemia. Some animals with severe illness can get hyperammonemia as well. We recognize that because our patients will become severely mentally obtunded after we feed them. There is a syndrome called refeeding syndrome. You don't oftentimes see it in parvovirus puppies. It's usually there kind of okay until two or three days before they present to you uh, just with uh, lethargy and uh, progressive inappetence and then vomiting and whatever. We most commonly see refeeding syndrome in chronically underfed or malnourished patients that then all of a sudden get uh, get fed. And basically what happens in these patients is that their body mass is so small that they, they have lost phosphorus and potassium from their intracellular environment out into their kidneys. And if we rehydrate them and refeed them, like this massive release of insulin that drives their whatever serum, potassium and phosphorus is in their circulation into the cells. And so we end up with a patient that is hypo phosphatemic and hypomagnesemic and hypokalemic and that can cause damage to our red blood cells and cause serious cardiac arrhythmias and poor gut motility and vomiting and so on.
But this is one that we, we don't often consciously see, but it can occur. So vitamin B is, a, we have a daily, uh, vitamin B is a water-soluble vitamin, so it is your excess is urinated out of the body every day, uh, particularly in cats. Cats need their B complex vitamins supplemented every day and dogs probably every couple of days when they're in hospital if they're not eating enough. So make sure that you schedule your patients to have vitamin B complex injections every couple of days. Uh, diarrhea and vomiting can obviously occur as a result of the diet. So we might just need to back off on the, on the amount we're feeding our patient and we can get these electrolyte imbalances also. So just before we go, I just want to mention a couple of things. I mentioned that if we want to feed a veterinary diet, uh, be it Hills, Royal Cannon, Purina, whichever one of those uh, those excellent diets that you're going to feed your patient that's more complex, that's better tailored and better balanced for dogs and cats, you're going to need to probably place an esophagostomy tube. Okay, These veterinary diets, unless they are designated liquid diets in a can, uh, the solid diets that we blenderize up, they will block up and nasogastric tube very reliably, okay? And in which case, then you need to take your tube out and place a new one, which is a real hassle in these little sick patients. So place an esophagostomy tube if you're planning to feed any sort of blenderized diet down them. The other thing I will mention about nasogastric tubes is don't be tempted to put medications down your nasogastric tube. If you're feeding oral medications, they will also block up your nasogastric tube. So make sure you give your oral medications through the mouth, not squirt to down your nasogastric tube. The other thing is that if you have a patient that is doing really well with parvovirus enteritis, it's tolerating its nutrition, everything's looking good, its abdominal pain is subsiding and everything's looking fine and then it suddenly starts to vomit and look worse again, this is what you need to be concerned about. It's called an intersusception where one part of the bowel telescopes into another part of the bowel. And an intersusception will cause a puppy that is improving clinically to all of a sudden deteriorate. So have a good palpate of the abdomen. You and your vets work together to palpate the abdomen to make sure that, uh, to, to see if you can feel these things. Ultrasound, this is what they look like on an ultrasound. We have a larger section of bowel here and we have another section of bowel that is telescoped on the in, inside of it. That is a cross section of the of the bowel here. So what we're seeing is an intersusception. This is a surgical emergency. We need to reduce this intersusception many patients need a partial intestinal resection and anastomosis. So that's what I had for you this evening. Uh, basically, I wanted to just highlight that nutritional support of these canine parvo patients is both essential and mandatory. Begin nutritional support early. We start feeding our patients in our hospital within six hours of coming in with parvovirus enteritis. Begin with that microenteral nutrition. It's amazing. Play, place a nasogastric tube and suction out that, those stomach contents, especially if you've got a patient that is uh, refractory, uh, has refractory vomiting that's not subsiding despite using one or two or three antiemetics. Then begin uh, with microenteral nutrition, then a low fat, preferably a hydrolyzed diet. If you can't get hold of vital, then maybe start with Jevity, for example, that supplemented Jevity. But just start in small concentrations, sorry, small volumes to make sure that your patient is going to tolerate that diet. There's been lots and lots of good questions that I will get to in a second. Uh, don't forget the infectious disease course. Uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, Charisma and I are very happy to be emailed about, uh, the, about the course if you want some more information. But check out our website, veteducation.com.au and click on courses. Go to Vet Nurse Courses and the course details are there as well. But it starts in 10 days' time. Don't forget we have a lovely course book there for you. We've joined forces with CRC Press to give you a free manual and Charisma is just going to bring onto the screen. Well, actually, I'll bring onto the screen now actually an image of the book that we have got uh, for you. Coming up, Small Animal and Infectious Diseases, a quick reference. It's got a number of chapters. It's about 240 pages, so it's like a full reference text and you get that absolutely free with the course as well. And I'm going to now uh, try and retrace my steps and
Uh, well, firstly, I want to thank you all for coming along this evening, uh, nearly 300 of you here, so thank you so much for sticking around for the lecture. Um, a couple of questions uh, that I want to follow up with. Is it okay to give potassium chloride added with normal saline for IV purpose? Um, yes, you can. if you've only got normal saline for your intravenous fluids for these patients, you can certainly supplement that with potassium chloride for uh, your maintenance intravenous fluids. The problem with sodium chloride is that it is too high in sodium and too high in chloride to be used any longer than for the first 24 hours or so. What I would be using if you didn't have lactated ringer solution, which is also actually only should be used only for about 24 hours. After the first 24 hours, what I would be doing is moving to half strength sodium chloride, so 0.45% sodium chloride with 2.5% glucose, and you can add potassium chloride to that at 20 milli equivalents per liter. That has about the right amount of sodium, the right amount of chloride, and with the potassium supplementation, the right amount of potassium for normal urinary losses. Now, if your patient's got vomiting and diarrhea, you're going to need to maybe have a second bag of lactated ringer solution or normal saline to help replace all of the chloride and the sodium that's being lost in your patient's vomiting and diarrhea. We're going to go into that in a lot more detail in the course as well. Oh, good question from Arun. Can we give atropine to reduce the secretion um, to prevent gastric stasis. I'm really glad you asked that question. I think that's a great question. Atropine is one of those drugs that on the surface of it seems like it might be a good idea, but on deeper reflection, it's actually not. And the reason it's not a good idea, and the reason I would never use it in a patient with gastrointestinal disease, is that it decreases gut motility. Okay, it will decrease gastric motility and decrease intestinal motility. So we end up with a paralyzed gastrointestinal tract. Okay. The other thing is it will dry out secretions elsewhere in the body that we don't want to dry out, like our respiratory secretions. So um, atropine, I don't give to uh, alter gastrointestinal motility. It doesn't work the way that we think that it might. Can we use metoclopramide for patients who are vomiting? Yes, we can. Um, and can we add it to the fluid bag? Yes, we can. Sucralfate, we've answered. Uh, let me see. Uh, we've got a question here. Dim says that they've only got metoclopramide available, no meropotent. Um, so how can we control the vomiting? And I hopefully I've answered that. What I would be considering if the only antiemetic you've got is metoclopramide, I'd be putting a nasogastric tube in your patients and using that for suction. You may be able to get a prescription for ondansetron uh, from a pharmacy, a human pharmacy. Uh, so using ondansetron, they come in little wafers, oral wafers, and they just dissolve on the patient's tongue. And that might be another antiemetic that you can use if you don't have meropotin. So use ondansetron wafers in your patient, plus metoclopramide, plus a nasogastric tube. What's our protocol for admission of parvovirus patients into hospital? Some practices locally won't let them into the clinic and their practices that won't treat them. These are little patients that are of, of all of the, I guess, inverted commas, routine critical patients that we see, they are in need of our help um, just as much as, as, as a patient that's been hit by a car or attacked by a dog. Um, they, you know, if you have a good isolation area in your practice, then that's brilliant. It makes these patients easier to manage. I've worked in practices where we have just had tape on the floor, okay, in private practices uh, when I was working in general practice, and we have just cordoned off an area of the practice, or we've shifted a cage into an area of the practice that has low foot traffic that we can control, okay. So if you're not properly set up with an, is with a, an isolation ward, do the best you can with the environment and the restrictions that you have. But in my opinion, these are patients that need a lot of care. I think that as professionals, that we should be dealing with the uh, with the challenges that come with these patients, with appropriate disinfectant, appropriate personal protective equipment that we're all used to seeing and using now with coronavirus being around. It's the same kind of gear that we're doing uh, and using for parvovirus enteritis, not necessarily because we can get sick, um, although I certainly wouldn't want to come in contact with, you know, our oral, um, our oral intake of, of parvovirus species. That sounds like a terrible idea. But 
what we're trying to do is this is a highly infectious disease and it's readily transmissible to other animals in the hospital. So get the, the right sort of gear set up, different shoes. We have big white gum boots in our in our um, in our isolation ward, we, we're not allowed to walk into our isolation ward in, in our regular hospital shoes. We have to take them off and stick on these giant white gumboots and yellow protective uh, protective gowns, face masks, the works, and gloves so that we don't take anything out of that isolation area. Even if you don't have a separate room in your practice, this is something that you should be able to set up uh, in, in your practice as well. So. Um, I think that that's, there's lots of logistics that, that would need to be discussed, I guess, with your colleagues about how you could perhaps manage these patients. Um, in which position should the patient be placed for nasogastric tube that is passed? I like to have them in sternal recumbency, but if the patient is really lethargic and obtundent, then you can place them in when they're in lateral recumbency. Oh, right, sorry, yeah, the, the colony stimulating factor, sorry about that. Um, now, there's been a bit of research on... Uh, on the use of colony stimulating factors and, uh, and, and, and other things as well in order to try to help promote the immune system. And the evidence that's been published doesn't support a great deal of difference in terms of reducing mortality or hospital stay. So I think it makes us feel better. Um, but I'm not sure that it that it makes a big deal of difference to our patients. We would certainly dearly love for some of these things to help our patients, but it doesn't seem that they uh, that they do terribly much in in our patients. And I guess the reason for that is that the parvovirus itself. Uh, is destroying the white blood cell progenitor cells in the bone marrow. Okay, that not completely because obviously these animals recover from this illness, um, but the body itself is trying to make as many white blood cells as it can, but the virus itself is preventing it from doing it. So unless we have specific antiviral targets that kill these, kill the viral, uh, kill the virus itself, um, I think some of these medications uh, can, uh, you know, are probably destined to perhaps produce that best quite modest improvements in patients and it obviously adds a cost to your patients as well oh great question about neutrogel i think that i think that's a great question neutrogel for those of you who don't know a neutrogel is kind of a um, a paste that is high in, in protein and fats and carbohydrates it's good vitamins and minerals it's uh, used as a as a nutrient supplement for patients who are suffering from critical illness and I think if you have that in your practice and if the animals like it and a lot of them do it smells terrific then I think that it is really really fantastic to, to use so I, I think you could use that alongside or instead of your microenteral nutrition or even somewhere between microenteral nutrition and feeding a diet like modified Jevity formula and so on so I think yeah that, that sounds like a really nice thing to do. Um, Immune-rich plasma, uh, that's another question as well. We're going to talk a little bit more about that during the course as well. But suffice to say that hyperimmune canine plasma or immunoglobulins have not been associated with improved outcomes in parvo. They don't make things worse, but they're not the silver bullet that we hoped that they would be. All right. I'm going to finish off there now. You can keep typing those questions in. But thank you so much, everybody, for coming along this evening for tonight's webinar. It's been my pleasure uh, speaking with you. And uh, thank you for all of your fabulous questions as well. If you do have any questions at all about the content of tonight's lecture or about the course coming up, please feel free just to make contact with us. Our email address is uh, info at bededucation.com.au. I'll stop talking now because I've been going for nearly an hour and a half. <laughs> Thank you and good evening.